I was particularly happy to read those bands this morning because uh, weddings have been very much on my mind recently. In January, we went to the wedding of our granddaughter. Um, and uh, we were all, when the guests were staying at the self catering hotel, self catering being the important word, and they for the wedding, the bride and the groom and their friends set to and prepared the barn for the reception. The wedding was going to be held in the local church and then they were, coming, they were all coming back to the barn, but it needed to be set up. Well, we oldest stood back and let them get on with it because they were all having such fun. We could hear the laughter and of course lots of teasing, even as we made sure there was plenty of tea, coffee and cake for the workers. I imagine that at other times, laying tables, folding decorations, let alone setting up everything things like lighting, and could be seen as a bit of a chore. But because of those who were very involved in it, were joining together in a common purpose, and it was an exciting purpose, the activity became a source of joy. Each person there wanted to do their bit in serving the special couple. And that, of course, is the subject for our thought this week, servanthood and all those words which are associated with it. And because servanthood is based on uh, one of the ideas that springs from the Father this Chan's book, Letters to the Church. Francis Chan challenges his readers to consider how churches have drifted from God's desire for them. And in the opening paragraph of his book, he asks us to consider what our understanding of the church would be if we, all we knew about the church came from the Bible. And then he asks us to decide if our present church situation resembles that early pattern. And in each chapter, Chan concentrates on a different aspect of how God has designed his church to function and what the church looks like in its areas today. Speaking of servanthood, but all those words with it, service, serving, service. We believe that Jesus has set us an example of how we, as his followers, should live a life of service. Now, probably you like me know many non Christians who live good lives helping their neighbours and taking action to make the world a better place. And surely God is at work in them, even when they don't know it. But our advantage is that we know where our desire to serve comes from, because it comes from Jesus, and that knowledge brings us joy, just as the knowledge of those young people helping the bride and groom brought them great joy. And this joy and this service is explained in the passage we heard from King Paul's letter to the Philippians. Some of these words are thought to be taken from kind of early hymn sung by Christians as they gathered in worship. And they speak of Jesus emptying himself of his godly power when he takes on human form and shares the life and the death of his people. Jesus didn't come on earth with all the power of God and intended to use it. He emptied himself of that power. He humbled himself. And he did this not in order to seek glory, but out of love for his creation. We are his creation. <laughs> and we see Jesus acting out this humility and servant throughout his life. Where is he born? Not in a palace, but in a humble stable. What about his baptism? He baptized by like John Baptist, even though John says, No, no, he should be you baptizing me. But Jesus says, No, this is how it is to be. Jesus heals and teaches right to the point of exhaustion. We hear how tired he is how much he needs 
his time of art, still he continues. And of course, he allows himself to be tortured and killed. And Pontius Pilate tries to claim power over Jesus' life and death, but Jesus reminds him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. So Jesus becomes a servant. He gives up his power out of love and obedience to God. And he teaches servanthood to his followers by setting the example. He tries to drive home his teaching as he comes to the end of his life. And you'll remember that at the Last Supper, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples with the words, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Servanthood by example. And all through his ministry, Jesus has prepared his disciples to carry on his work in building the church. And all through his ministry, his disciples have found humility and servanthood so hard to understand. And we hear proof of that in our gospel reading when we hear how those two major players in the disciple team completely misunderstand what's going on. James or John, James and John, and their mother, well, it's through their mother, you can imagine this very diligent mother. Um, I'm always reminded of um, some of the mothers at um, parent-teacher in, uh, interviews. I, uh, many years ago, when I was a teacher, you could always tell the mother of James and John who would come in wanting the best for her child. And no doubt, that would be good power to her, really, if you all want the best for her children. But the mother had quite got it right when she asked Jesus for the best places in heaven. The vision is simply a human scenario imposed on top of a supernatural one, because they are picturing a banquet with a seat the giver of the banquet, the giver of the fits, seated at the top table. And so the places their special friends will be on the right and on the left. And Jesus has used this image of a banquet many times in his preaching. But what he uses it for is to emphasize being humble rather than claiming the best seats. So that the third part of the service the giver of the feast will ask you to come up. But James and John have not that message at all. But Jesus knows their potential. Jesus understands them even when they don't understand him. And that's great good for us. <coughs> God understands us, even when we don't fully understand him. Because instead of rebuffing them, Jesus explains to James and John the cost of following him. There will be great joy, but first, great suffering. That's his message to them. And it's worth remembering that John becomes the great gospel writer and preacher. That his message is always based on love. There's a tradition that he continued to preach throughout his life, but distilled his message more and more so that the sermons got shorter and shorter. And finally, the only sermon he preached were the words, Little children love one another. James, his brother, becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And it's there that he's killed by King Herod, one of the early martyrs of the church. But in their early days, they didn't understand that serving others meant giving up all desire for personal status and putting others first. They had to learn. Now, in some churches, other churches I visited, there are people who try to push themselves to the front. And they're very good at helping, but it's always done very quietly. And sometimes we're concerned that they are seeking recognition and praise. And there are the other kind of people who ensure that things are done, who are there and needed, but take a back step 
can notice afterwards. Simply happy that God's work is being done. And we can get to the cross with the first sort, just as the disciples got across with James and John. But if we take the leaf out of Jesus, we can encourage people rather than condemn them. And who knows where people's ministry may lead. Jesus reminds his disciples and us of the teaching, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. As Christians, our calling is to be the servants of others. That's our lifestyle, and it's a lifestyle that brings us joy because we're modeling ourselves on the life of Jesus. And we recognize those who seem to have a natural gift for helping others. Sometimes we may feel a little disheartened because we always seem to be too slow, too sharp, or perhaps lacking in whatever's needed. But God created us all different. And he created us all with gifts. Some are plain to see and some are hidden. They emerge when God and our neighbours need them. Many of these gifts, indeed, are ones we are using all the time and we simply don't value them or notice them. For example, there's the gift of listening to others without interrupting. There's a gift of visiting and being to the person we visit, laughter, or perhaps quietness, whatever is needed. And there is the gift of prayer on our own for others. Never underestimate the power of prayer that is offered for someone who feels the effect but does not know its source. We all have something to contribute. And the chances are not, you're doing it already. Now's the time to find joy in it and help others find their joy by allowing them to serve you. I still get a bit prickly when someone offers me their seat in a crowded train. It does happen. Of course I don't need a seat. Do I look back old? Well, you do actually seat <laughs> How will the person feel if he refuses? And will he or she ever offer again if you turn them down? So let's help other people be the servants in their own way. Because we're the church. And the church follows the example of Jesus in being the servant of others. And it's holding our hearts those words that we heard. Let the same mind be in you was in Jesus Christ.